They're doing this first few years when the Buddha started to teach. The Buddhist monasteries were quite different from how they are now. Um, the, the monks, they were just living in some parks and forests and wilderness um, without any buildings. Yeah, the Buddha and the monks would just live there under a tree, in the forest, in the open, or in a cave, or in a cemetery. And most of the monks at that time were still noble disciples. And so they didn't feel they need anything more and just felt peaceful living there in nature. Um, yeah, but one day, um, a rich banker living in Rajagaha sees the monks coming from the forest, from different places, going on arms rounds and is inspired by the conduct and their peaceful appearance. And then he has some idea and he thinks he could offer them some lodgings, some kutis, meditation huts. And so he asks the monks if he would offer them some dwellings, would they live in them? And the monks are restrained and um, they, ask, they tell him the Buddha didn't say anything about lodgings yet and we will go to ask, or the, the banker says, then go to ask the Buddha whether they are allowable or not. Um, then, as you can see, the Buddha allows various kinds of buildings, otherwise we would be sitting here now under some trees in the, in the open, um, and yeah, also lays down various rules about them. Then so the monks tell the banker, who is very enthusiastic, in this building 60 huts for the monks. And so that's how it came about, that there are monasteries with buildings as we know them. At the time of the Buddha, the two largest cities were Rajagaha, capital of the kingdom of Magadha, where the Buddha started to teach. And then second one, Savati, the capital of the kingdom of Kosala. <coughs> and Anathapindika was a rich banker from Savati. But um, yeah, the teaching of the Buddha didn't, wasn't transmitted there yet. Um, Yeah, his name means he gives alms to those who need help. So probably he was already a generous person before. And Anathapindika was married to the sister of this rich banker in Rajagaha, who donated these first 60 dwellings to the Sangha. So usually the rich people marry other rich people for some to, that the wealth of the family continues to grow. And so they obviously meet another, they marry like this. And yeah, this was probably a few years after the Buddha started to teach. And then another Pindika is traveling on some business trip to Rajagaha. Also at that time, people were going on business trips already. And um, yeah, as, as usual, he would visit his brother, brother-in-law when he was living in Rajagaha. And usually when Anathapindika arrived at the house of his brother-in-law, he would be treated like a special guest and, you know, um, and yeah, the brother-in-law would mm. leave aside any other duties and welcome him. But this time the reception of Anathapindika is different and his brother-in-law doesn't pay any attention to him. He's just busy organizing something and giving orders to his servants and workers. And so, the yeah, Anathapindika is used to be treated as a respected person of high status. And so he's maybe a little bit displeased about it. And he thinks, before that, he was just put aside everything else and would just welcome him. 
would just welcome me and um, look after me. But now he's just busy running around and um, but maybe they have some wedding or King Bimisara is coming to visit or they make some great offering. Um, when, the when the brother-in-law finally finishes all his things that he has to organize, then he yeah, greets another Pindika and so he asks him about the preparations going on and then he tells him, yeah, we don't have a wedding and the king is also not coming but he's preparing a big offering and the Buddha, the awakened one, is coming for the meal tomorrow. And Anatta Pindika is immediately like, uplifted and amazed to hear these words, Buddha, the awakened one. And so yeah, then when, when his brother-in-law tells him the Buddha is coming for the meal, then he says, he says, did you say the Buddha? And the brother-in-law says, yes, the Buddha. And he asks him a second or third time, did you say the Buddha, the awakened one? And the other Pindika is immediately captivated by this idea of an awakened one. And he says, even the sound, the awakened one, is rare to hear in this world. And he immediately wants to go to see him. So yeah, one can also notice there, probably some previous life um, connection. But for example, now in Sri Lanka or in Thailand or Burma, people hear the name the Buddha often and they're not captivated by it. They're just, just completely ordinary for them. Or they see a Buddha statue and so often in stupas and <coughs> often they never get interested that much. <coughs> And with Anatta Pindika is immediately yeah, inspired by just hearing the words the Buddha. Maybe practiced Bud Buddha meditation in a previous life. Is the, So he asks his brother-in-law whether it would be possible to visit the Buddha. But he tells him it's not the right time now, but tomorrow early in the morning he can go to visit him. And so another Pindika is going to sleep and thinking Early tomorrow, I can go to see the Blessed One, the Arahants, the Perfectly Awakened One. And he's yeah, so much focused on meeting the Buddha that he already wakes up three times during the night and thinking it's already dawn and time that he can finally go to see the Buddha. Yeah, he has this bright and inspired mind looking forward to see the Buddha leaving the city and going out into the wilderness in the morning when it's still dark. And one has to remember the Buddha was often living in places which were actually maybe frightening for average person, such as some jungle in India, some forest, or some you know, in the middle of nowhere. And yeah, obviously, so under the Pindigo was more from a city environment and a rich person is probably afraid of being alone and robbers and wild animals. And so as he goes out there to the wilderness then the light and inner brightness disappear and the confidence wanting to see the Buddha sort of vanishes and becomes weaker and he is too frightened to continue and um, but then yeah, a friendly yaka, a friendly spirit is encouraging him to go on, uh, continue, and tells him, go forward, householder, go forward. And um, so he regains his confidence. And it happened another time, second or third time. So again, he gets frightened, but then he gets encouraged again. And so he continues to walk on, walking to the Sitavana. This is some forest close to Rajagaha. And then he finally sees the Buddha. 
Mm -hmm. Doing walking meditation in the open, in the distance. And the Buddha sees another Pindika coming um, and steps down from the walking path, sits down on his mat, is calling another Pindika, says, Come Sudatta. And yeah, so he already knows which great disciple is coming to visit him now. Sometimes, also with other disciples, he already calls them by name because he knows a special person is coming. For example, when they were in Markasapa and others. Hmm. And yeah, Alta Pinika is already very happy that the, the Buddha is, a, is already calling him by his name. And so if you would meet the Buddha, how would you start a conversation with him? It's the first time under the Pindika is meeting the Buddha. How to st what to say <laughs> now? <laughs> and um, yeah, so under the Pindika is bowing down to the Buddha and says, did the blessed one sleep well? So it's just starting with a harmless question, a small talk question. <laughs> um, so one can also see the different you know, inclinations of people the different people approaching the Buddha in different suttas, how they interact with the Buddha, and seeing different levels of development. For example, when some Brahmins visit the Buddha, then sometimes they would praise him with some lofty verses about his inspiring qualities, or some Brahmins would just spontaneously um, they ask the Buddha a question in, in verse, some profound question that it just makes them up some verse spontaneously. And yeah, Alta Pindika just asks him this very simple question. Um, nevertheless, the Buddha answers the short, the Buddha answers the simple question with a profound verse. Um, and yeah, so explaining why he explaining why he's sleeping well. And so the Buddha mm. yeah, says, um, he, sleeps all, he sleeps always happily. The Brahmin who is realized Nibbana, who is not stained by sense pleasures, cool at heart without acquisitions, having cut off all attachments, having, having removed all distress from the heart, the peaceful one sleeps well, having attained peace of the mind. So um, it's a profound reason why the Buddha is sleeping peacefully and giving the giving another Pindika a first preview of the teaching or of the goal of the of his teaching with this verse before I even starts to teach him. Yeah, and so the Buddha is introducing him to the Dhamma and yeah, when his mind is free from the five hindrances and then malleable and uplifted, then he explains the teaching unique to the awakened ones, to him the vulnerable truth, the dukkha, the origin, cessation and the path. It's just a short summary there, this stock description. And under the Pindika, already at the first meeting, it becomes a stream enterer and realizes the first level of awakening. And so then he is, uh, he is expressing his, um, his uh, um, gratitude or inspiration of the teaching and, and um, takes refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And he invites him together with the monks, with the whole community for the meal on the next day. And the Buddha agrees and another Pindika pays respects and departs. So other people hear about the meal invitation and try to help another Pindika because he's just a visitor. And so the, the brother-in-law is helping him, telling him he can provide him some funds that he can um, finance this big meal offering but another Pindika says he already has enough money, he doesn't need any extra funds. 
and then even the city council and the king as well offer their help, but under the pinnacle is declining friendly. And so he invites the Buddha to come to the home of the brother-in-law. And after the Buddha finished eating, he invites the Buddha and the Sangha to spend the next rains retreat in Sabati, in his home city. And the Buddha is just giving him a one sentence hint on what kind of place might be suitable. And he says, the Tathagatas delight in empty dwellings. So in the sense of giving him a hint what kind of suitable place might be good for the monks and him to live there. And another Pindika says, I understand, blessed one. So he has already some um, idea just from this one short instruction. And after Anatta Pinika finishes his business in Rajagaha, he's traveling back to Savati. And he has many friends, many colleagues, and was an important person. And so while he's traveling back to Savati, he's telling all the people that he knows on the way that they are perfectly awake and one has arisen in the world. And he was invited by me and he will come along on this road so they can make some preparations and um, support the Buddha and the monks traveling from Rajagaha to Savati. And another Pindika then returns back to Savati and is looking for a place where the Buddha and the monks could live, not too close or too far from the city, and this little noise and seclusion and suitable for meditation but also that people can still come to visit. And while he's looking at different properties, he sees a park owned by Prince Jeta, one of the sons of King Pasenadi. Another Pindika goes to Prince Jeta and asks him to sell the park because he wants to establish a monastery there. But Prince Jeta doesn't want to sell the park. And so he's just saying a ridiculous price to put off another Pindika from buying the property. So he, he just says, the park is not for sale, not even for 100,000 gold coins. And another Pindika says, sold. But Prince Jeta says, no, the park is not sold. Um, because yeah, he's disagreeing because he just said this outrageous price to express that he actually doesn't want to sell it. So they can't agree and they go to the Minister of Justice to settle the case and the Minister of Justice says you say the price prince and another Pindika agreed on it so the park is sold for the price that you determined. And so this is it. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, and another Pindika gets people to bring cards with the gold coins and spreading them out in the park. But with the first loads of the coins, they were not enough. And a small area um, at the entrance of the park still had to be covered with coins to make the price complete. So under the Pindika tells people to get more coins. Um, but then Prince Jeta sees them and he thinks that must be some very special thing that under the Pindika is paying so much money for establishing this monastery. And so he spontaneously abandons his possessiveness about the park and he um, wants to contribute something to the monastery. With this. This is enough. I cover this last space. That will be my donation. So he loses the last chance to also make a donation for the monastery before um, he would have, um, under the pinnacle, would have 
um, paid the price completely. <laughs> yeah, and Anato Pinnika is very happy that Prince Jeta joins in. Yeah, Prince Jeta then gets an entry gate to the monastery built on that space that was donated by him. And yeah, Anato Pinnika organizes various buildings to get built there, meditation huts for the Buddha and the monks, and walking path, wells, bathrooms, lotus ponds, and so on. And yeah, then when the Buddha arrives with the monks, another Pindika asks him how he should proceed with the monastery that he prepared. And the Buddha says he should offer it to the Sangha of the Four Quarters, present and future. And so this is the story how the Buddha's most important monastery was established. Anatta Pindika must have found a very good place, just based on this one sentence instruction by the Buddha, the Tathagatas, the light and empty dwellings. He found this place where the Buddha spent most of his time after his awakening, 19 Vassas, 19 Rains Retreat. And most discourses of the Buddha um, were given at that place. And by inviting the Buddha to come to Savati, establishing um, the monastery, one person under the Pindika had a great influence on countless people. For example, King Pasenadi and Queen Marika became disciples of the Buddha. And you know, people could go there to practice generosity, listen to Dhamma talks of the Buddha and of great disciples, and associate with the people there, practice meditation and ordain. And yeah, up to the present day, now, Jadis Grove is not a monastery anymore, but has become a holy site, a pilgrimage site. And so 2,500 years later, people still go there every day. Hundreds of people go there to meditate, chant, recollect the life of the Buddha. And so we are still, these meritorious activities continue on that were started by another Pindika 2,500 years ago. And so yeah, monastery can be like a little oasis in the desert of samsara, some opportunity to, to do good actions and yeah, develop Dharma practice. Yeah, and similar things still happen today, in a sense. For example, um, George Sharp, the former president of the English Sangha Trust, and the purpose of the trust in Britain was to establish the monastic sangha in, in Britain. And after he became president, he was reflecting how he could best achieve that. And so then he was traveling to Buddhist, to Buddhist country, to Thailand, asked some great meditation teachers who had experience with starting monasteries, training monks, and asked them to send monks to Britain to establish the monastic sangha in Britain. And so Judge Sharp visited Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Mahabur in the 80s. And then similar just like with, with Anatta Pindika and Savati, then as a result of his efforts, then the Ajahn Mahabur didn't want to send monks there, but Ajahn Chah um, agreed to send Ajahn Sumedho. And then now we have this monastery in, monasteries in Britain, like Amravati, Chitta Viveka. So this is all similar case just like with Anatta Pindika in the more modern time. Yeah, Anatta Pindika also used the opportunity to visit the monastery that he established and listen to Dhamma talks by the Buddha, having some conversation with him. 
I checked and there are more than 20 Dhamma talks to him in the suttas, um, which is more than many great monk disciples. Um, and if you look at all these discourses, you can see that the Buddha was teaching him about all aspects of Dhamma practice, like uh, generosity, in the sense of encouraging him to support the Sangha, and talking about how to give or where to give, that it brings great benefits and results, benefits of practicing generosity, <coughs> or about using his wealth to benefit himself and others. And then also about karma, that the good fortune doesn't come for by just wishing for it or praying for it or hoping for it, but one has to do the actions that lead to good fortune or to benefits in the future, in the present. And so one has to yeah, develop the best kind of sealer, yeah, these three types of merit of generosity, virtue and meditation for of good fortune or then um, yeah, that's for benefits in this life and the future. Yeah, he's also encouraging him to talking about the benefits of keeping the precepts and dangers of not keeping them or teaching him about guarding his actions by body, speech and mind. Once he helps to sort out some family problems like his his daughter-in-law is a more like unfriendly person and not respectful to anyone. And then the Buddha is teaching her and sort of changing her mind. So <laughs> um, Chata. Yeah, and he also encourages another Pindika to practice not only generosity, but also develop Samadhi. That he should not just do that, but yeah, also develop the rapture of seclusion. So also practice meditation. And also teaching him about qualities of a stream enterer, developing six recollections of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and generosity, virtue and devas. That one can have a pleasant abiding by recollecting them in the sense that yeah, that one, if one thinks about those things and recollects them, that yeah, the, the mind can get uplifted and more unified and wholesome. And he also gives him the wider perspective of what brings great benefit in terms of dharma practice, and see, from offering food to noble disciples, to donating a monastery. But then he also says that taking refuge and observing the five precepts, developing loving kindness is actually more beneficial. And then the perception of impermanence even more. So he's also encouraging him to develop things beyond just being a generous person or, or precepts. Yeah, so the story of Anatta Pindika, when he goes to meet the Buddha, it's also a nice you see, simile in the sense that he first he hears about the Buddha and then he wants to meet him going out to the forest for the and, um, and then first he's enthusiastic to visit the Buddha early in the morning. But then when he goes out and it's still dark, then he sort of gets frightened and wants to turn back. And so, yeah, 
And if you imagine that Anatta Pindika would have turned back, and then he wouldn't have met the Buddha, and he, he wouldn't have realized dream entry, he wouldn't have offered Chetas Grove, and he wouldn't have heard all these Dhamma teachings of the Buddha, he wouldn't practice the Dhamma, so yeah, it would be a great loss for him, obviously. So it also goes to remember this attitude, that if sometimes you might be in some similar situation, you want to do something good, but then you get somehow unsure, should I really do that? Or uh, some other obstruction arises, <coughs> and then to, yeah, to remind you to go forward and not to turn back, in the sense that yeah, you have this clarity of what is beneficial or why it is important, and you pursue it no matter what maybe emotions come up or uncertainty or some external whatever, difficulties and to have this clarity and pursue the Dhamma practice. Uh, Anatta Pindika got ill several times, I think at least three or even four discourses, I think where he's ill, and then um, gets some Dhamma instructions, then sometimes, sometimes recovering, but then the last story is in Machimindakaya 143, and then, yes exactly, so, uh, then he sends a when he gets ill, he sends a messenger to Venerable Buddha, requesting him to come, and Venerable Buddha goes to visit him together with Venerable Ananda, and um, yeah, ask him, him whether he is getting better, and but he says no, it's, it's getting worse. Um, so it's already serious illness. And yeah, in, in brief summary, Whenever Sarah Buddha gives him a discourse about abandoning the six sense bases, so the visual faculty and the forms and the hearing faculty and the sounds and mental phenomena and the mind and all feelings that arise based on them. So then after this, yeah, and He's actually then he after the instruction he starts to cry, and then um, when the Sai Buddha asks him whether he's you know, dejected or, um, um, and, but then he says no, he's not. But he never heard such a dumber discourse before, and um, so he, he thinks also other lay people should be given a dumber discourse like that. Um, Maybe just because he never was given this instruction in this very direct way to do that now, in the sense, I think he probably heard some similar Dhamma discourses, um, but not in the sense that I should do that like now to give up the six sense spaces completely. <laughs> he didn't take it maybe so personal in the sense, and, um, and so it made a different impact on him when he passed away. And when the Buddha and Ananda leaving again, and soon afterwards Ananda Pindika passes away and reappears in Tusita Deva realm, one of the higher um, Deva realms, still part of the sense realm. So he only he, he only applied the instruction partially in a way. He um, he wasn't able to applied completely um, and otherwise he would have become an arahant or a like, non-returner um, but yeah probably he still had some major effects that he yeah um, got reborn in a higher deva realm of Tusita realm and so then um,
Yeah. Then some night afterwards, um, another Pindika reappears as young Deva in the Cheetah's Grove and visiting the Buddha and pays, pays respect to the Buddha and speaks a last verse to express his appreciation of um, what the teaching had the Buddha. And, yeah. About Anibasar Buddha as well. Oh, blessed is this Jeta's Grove, where the sagely Sangha dwells, and the king of the Dhamma, the source of all my happiness. By good actions, knowledge, and Dhamma, by virtue and noble way of life, where these are mortals purified, not by lineage or wealth. Therefore, a wise person who sees what truly leads to his own good should investigate the Dhamma and purify himself with it. Sariputta has reached the peak in virtue, peace, and wisdom's way. Any bhikkhu who has gone beyond, at best, can only equal him. So, and then, speaking this last verse of um, gratitude to the Buddha, he um, disappears, thinking the teacher has approved of me, and pays homage to the Buddha, and vanishes. And then, after the night has ended, the next morning, the uh, Buddha is mentioning to the monks, monks, last night, and in the last watch of the night, a uh, young deva came and illuminated the whole Jeta's Grove and visited me and spoke these verses. And then Venerable Ananda says to the Buddha, surely this young deva must have been under the Pindika, for the householder under the Pindika had perfect confidence in Venerable Sariputta. And the Buddha says, good, good, Ananda. As far as reasoning goes, you have drawn the right conclusion. The young Deva was under the Pindika and no one else. So when Ananda, just by the verses, he could, he noticed it's probably Ananda Pindika who must have come to visit. And um, the Buddha confirms from the direct knowledge. <laughs> And in 1863, Cheetah's Grove under the Pindagas Monastery was rediscovered by British archaeologists. So if you are in India and you can visit the Buddha's most important monastery, they gave most discourses. We can visit the Kuti, where I spent more time than anyone anywhere else and where I meditated. So it's a, it's a, yeah, a holy site. And if this uh, can visit the Cheetah's Grove and then there's a Kuti where many people go and where the Buddha was staying and yeah, can visit there to recollect the events and life of the Buddha and the great disciples. <laughs> yes? <laughs> 